Welcome to a very special episode of the Gay Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and today we're taking a trip down to sunny Fort Lauderdale to visit the renowned Stonewall National Museum and Archives. Our special guest today is Executive Director Hunter O'Hanion, who will be giving us a guided tour of the facility and all the resources about our gay history that are warehouse. Please join us on this very special trip. My name is Hunter O'Hanion. I'm the Executive Director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archive, and we're located here at 1300 East Sunrise in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we wanted to talk a little bit about Stonewall, uh, the library and the archive, how we came about, and show you uh, some of the history. Um, Because really what we have is the largest LGBTQ library in the world with 28,000 volumes. In our archive, we have 2,700 linear feet of LGBTQ material going back from about 1950 to the present day. When I first came here, I didn't really know what 2,700 linear feet really meant, and so I had to do a little bit of research. And if you go up the Empire State Building all the way up on one side and then all the way down the other, that's 2,700 linear feet. And it totals about 6 million pages of gay history. So we're going to get a chance to look at those, and we're going to look in the library. But let me also just give you a little bit of background. Stonewall, many people think, because the name that we have is related to the Stonewall Inn and the Stonewall Uprising in 1969 that happened in Sheridan Square in New York City. To some degree that's true, but primarily it's not true. Uh, We have nothing to do with the incident that happened at the Stonewall Inn. What happened was, in 1973, there was a young man in Hollywood, Florida, by the name of Mark Silber, and he was just coming out. His parents and family were from New York, and they had moved to South Florida, and his family was very supportive, and Mark was looking for a book about gay life. Now, remember, in 1973, uh, sodomy was illegal in most states in the United States. Most, mo- it was illegal in many states for gay people to even congregate to- together. Gay bars existed, places for p- people to get together existed, but in many places it was actually illegal. It was a very different time than it is today in 2021. But anyway, so Mark was looking for books and knowledge and information about um, what it actually meant to have same-sex attraction. And he found one book and two books, and then he found uh, about this many books, and he actually had a a shelf of books about uh, what it meant to be gay. And he called that shelf Stonewall. And the reason why he did that was because, having been from New York, he was aware of the uprising that had happened four years earlier, and he believed at the time that it was going to be a pivotal part in American history about LGBTQ rights. And you know what? He was right. Because, of course, today the word Stonewall really does speak to the modern um, movement for LGBTQ rights, not only in the United States, but actually around the world. So we bear the name Stonewall because of one individual's desire to actually use that as a tag for their own LGBTQ history and and journey as well. So over the years, uh, the library grew. It was... um, It was housed in a MCC church for some period of time, and then it was housed in a gay um, and lesbian community center here in Fort Lauderdale. And it just continued to grow and grow and grow. And now behind me, and if we can actually stand up, I want to do a little bit of a a walk around here. If we can sort of go around and grab the camera here. Behind me, what you're seeing are the DVDs, which are probably, uh, like many libraries, one of the most popular things out there. But come on over here, and we can take a look at what 28,000 volumes of LGBTQ fiction and nonfiction look like. So it's all organized under the Library of Congress, uh, 
system, um, and it's all cataloged and all available. You can come on down here with the camera. Um, it's all cataloged among uh, on our w website. You can see everything here. But here where we are, we're in fiction right now, BREs. And so you're seeing, and just turn the camera around and let them see many of the titles that, that are here. In a little while, I mean, right here, we're in the Bs. So here is a name many people might, might know, Rita Bray. Rita Mae Brown um, over here. We're in the D's. Um, and we can just come on down here and sort of go through here. This is, again, all fiction. Um, fiction continues uh, around over here. And then we move into nonfiction over here. Um, and uh, over here on on my left, your right, is the beginning of nonfiction. Not surprisingly, HQ in the um, Library of Congress system, which is about human sexuality, is one of the largest sections that we have here. Here's a recent great book uh, by Hugh Ryan called When Brooklyn Was Queer. Um, and, uh, you know, they're just, the, the work just continues to come in. What's amazing is that we do acquire some books ourselves, but so many of these books are donated to us by people that actually care about the idea that a gay library w would exist. Many of these titles, of course, can be found in any major urban library, but the value is that these things are all together in one place. Here we are over here in the end of the fiction over here. Look at this big Gore Vidal section over here. You can see all of these titles over here. There's a big Oscar Wilde section down here at the end of the alphabet as well, too. So. Um, the nonfiction continues to move over here. And let me just stop for a second to say biographies. There are about 900 biographies over here and on the other side here as well. We, for our scope of the library, the works in the library have to either be by an LGBTQ person or about an LGBTQ person. So uh, from that point, we, we really will take anything. Um, and even if it's cr critical, uh, some people ask, do we have works by Nita Bryant? Yes, we, we do. We have work uh, by people. As long as it's on the t topic of LGBTQ, we take them all. Over here, you see there's a big section on AIDS. Here you see a section on visual arts. Uh, um, we have theater over here, music. Um, here, of course, now in literature and letters, we have the Noel, Kyer, Noel Coward Diaries over here, Virginia Woolf, here's Oscar Wilde's Diaries. We then move over into the back here. Now we're into prose and poems. Uh, you can see a uh, you know, huge collection of Ginsberg, uh, uh, Truman Capote. Here we are. Uh, here we are again with with poetry and and prose, uh, theater, criticism, memoir is all here as well too. Um, and now over here we end up um, with military, with art, um, and um, and then we end up all the way here at the end at new t titles. Uh, we do our best to keep uh, new t titles c coming in. We have copies of all the recent Lambda Literary Award winners here. And then behind me, you see all the oversized books, which are, uh, for the most part, um, art-based books. Um, and then, of course, we have a juvenile and young adult section as well, and we have great resources. So on our website, it's stonewall-museum.org. Again, you can search the entire card catalog here and see every t title that's here. And there are also research aids that, that are there as well, so you can actually look at a particular topic and um, you can then see what books. So it might be trans criticism, it might be race relations, it might be disco, it might be um, uh, botany. There's a gay botany section. So you can see all of those t titles that are there as well. So let's take a look into the archive. So um, a major part of Stonewall, of course, in addition to its library, is its archive. And um, there are probably about 75 archives, LGBTQ archives, in the United States. A lot of them are at major uh, educational institutions and major libraries. NYU has a big one. There's the Gerber Hart in Chicago. Uh, there's the One Archive at USC. Uh, there's a great one in San Francisco. And we're very fortunate to be um, probably the second or third largest LGBTQ archive in the United States. Now, we have um, 
2,700 linear feet in the archive, as I said, and that totals about 6 million pages. It's all been cataloged. Um, it's all been professionally pre preserved. And the building that we're in is a former Broward County Library building. We have about 5,000 square feet here. We're very f fortunate to have this amazing space. And so it allows us to preserve uh, the archival materials that we have in a safe en environment. Uh, right now, in 2021, we're beginning a big project to digitize a lot of the holdings that we have because we want to be able to make them available to a worldwide audience. And we also want to be sure that a lot of the serials and publications that we have in the archive are being pre preserved because obviously many of these publications were not meant to last forever. Uh, some of them are now 60, 70 years old. Um, there's a lot of acid in the paper um, and uh, inexpensive paper was used on a lot of them and so it's important for us to preserve them. But out of the archives, we bring exhibitions out. And so the exhibition behind me right now is called Don't Ask, Do Tell. And starting over here on the left in 1778, you can see we begin the story of the relationship between the LGBTQ community and the U.S. military. And it begins with a lieutenant in George Washington's time who was arrested for sodomy. And then we go to um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's time in which in Newport there was actually entrapment of gay sailors in the early part of the 20th century um, in Newport, Rhode Island. We go through the Second World War and then this is one of the things that I think is very interesting because during the Second World War the U.S. Army and the U.S. military was very busy fighting wars and they weren't able to discharge as many people as they wanted to uh, for homosexuality. So they just gave them these blue discharges. They didn't actually court-martial them. But here you have from our archives a document from the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1949, now that the country is not at war anymore, laying out the three principal grounds that you could actually dis you could dishonorably discharge somebody fr from the uh, army or from any of the, of the branches of the service. This went to the Secretary of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And the three categories was if it was if there was a sexual relationship that was forced, class two was if it was consensual, and then most importantly to understand was class three. And class three was simply if you were suspected of not being a heterosexual, you could be discharged for that entire um, for, for, for that idea that somebody had about you. Shortly after this, um, this came into place in 1949, as I said, and shortly after that, President Dwight D. Eisenhower issued an executive order in which he said homosexuals could not serve in any part of the U.S. military because they could be blackmailed. Of course, the only reason why they would be blackmailed is because the government said it was a bad thing for somebody to have shame about. So they created the problem and then put punished people for the problem that they created. Things happened, of course, in the 1950s, and of course it was wonderful that organizations like the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Belitis grew up, and, and really a big pivotal point was 1975 when you had Leonard Matlovich, who had received a Purple Heart, and he came out as gay. He, the government said to him, you, we, will not di we, we will not discharge you. You can have your benefits and, and your VA benefits and all that stuff, but you have to publicly say you'll never have sex with a man again. And he refused to do it. He was discharged, and he ended up suing the government to get his benefits back. Uh, they settled out of court. We don't know how much that was, and unfortunately, he died of AIDS in the 1980s. Jimmy Carter was somebody who had some support for gays in the military, but of course, things really didn't change until Bill Clinton in 1992 when he ran on, on the platform that gays would be allowed into the U.S. military. Um, he ran on that. Many gay people thought that was going to happen. It was one of the first issues he took up in January of 1993. And here you see a USA Today, a full-page ad in USA Today from April 1993 with no one other than Colin Powell saying allowing homosexuals and the armed forces would destroy the military. And of course, let's remember, at this time, Colin Powell in Gulf War I, he was one of the leading figures in the United States. What they said at that time is that they argued that homosexuals were notoriously promiscuous and that their presence would make straight soldiers feel uncomfortable. Thus, it would create, again, another security risk as a result of it. 
Clinton caved and they came up with the grand bargain, which was don't ask, don't tell. Gays can serve, but you just can't talk about it. That stayed in place for 17 years, and it wasn't until the Obama years that that was actually uh, completely d done away. During Trump's time, uh, the ban on transsexual serving in the military was there. And then, of course, t today we have, with Joe Biden's time, we have there's no restriction on gays being in the military. There are now about 65,000 openly gay men and women serving in the military. And what we see in looking at this 225 years is that that there's been this very fraught history between the g government and gays and le lesbians and how much power individual presidents actually have to be able to change this and how much power we have as citizens when, when we vote. Uh, one good thing that just happened on the 10th anniversary of the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell is that the federal government and the VA has announced that all of those that have been discharged because of their sexual orientation will be able to get their benefits reinstated to them. That happened in September 2021 and it's a big improvement. So from our standpoint, point as far as human rights go, all we ask is that these kind of things uh, pr progress. So let's go into the archive itself and we'll be able to take a look at things there. One thing I want to stop with here, be just because we're here and this is, um, this is um, Gay History Month, let's wake this little guy up here. And um, as I said before, our main w website is stonewall-museum.org, but people can also go to stonewallnma.org, stonewallnma.org, and what you'll see is the new LGBTQ uh, t timeline. There are now over 800 entries in this t timeline. Uh, categories, HIV, AIDS, arts, business, film and TV, literature, memorials and monuments. And it shows you exactly what our LGBTQ history has. And you can stop in on any of these things. I'm not being, I'm not being very good with these right now. Um, and you can put this on your phone. Um, here you're looking at actual monuments. So here you have a story about the AIDS quilt uh, being in uh, Washington. Um, and let's go to, here is, um, in New York, those of you who remember St. Vincent's Hospital and all the AIDS deaths that were, were there, here's the new AIDS Memorial across the street from where, uh, St. Vincent's Hospital was. Um, get back over here. Let's take a look at film and TV. And here we have some early actors. Here we have Farley Granger, uh, Tommy Kirk, Raymond Burr. I never knew Raymond Burr was gay. Uh, but uh, yes, of course, uh, everybody, of course, remembers over a certain age, remembers Perry Mason, Anthony Perkins, Richard Chamberlain from Dr. Kildare, Paul Lind from, uh, from Bewitched and uh, The Match Game. Uh, it's, so it's a great way for you to be able to see. And what's nice about this project is it allows us to constantly update what's going on here. And so you can again search sports, you can search business. And again, that's Stonewall dash, I'm sorry, stonewallnma.org. It's free uh, and it, anybody can use it. And if you go to the website, there's also a teaching aid for classrooms as well too. So we'll come into here. This is our other exhibition space. And again, we're in um, October 2021 while we're doing this. And we actually are putting up an exhibition right now. These objects will, now, will be on the wall. And so you're getting a sneak uh, peek of this. So if you turn it around here, this show is called Misinformation, True and Not So True Early Information About AIDS. And so we took a look into the books that we had in the library, as well as old serials, to take a look uh, going back to 1981 to 1982 and 83, and the uh, the misinformation that was spread about AIDS at that time. And there were things about the idea that vitamin C could could cure it. Uh, here you see no lesbian blood, that lesbians were giving blood. Other people are saying it's related to herpes. Um, there's, a, there's just a, an amazing book here called The AIDS Time Bomb, which is there are millions with AIDS and other diseases ready because of dirty vaccines that they had. 
How familiar does all of this sound to what we're going through today and uh, understanding what's ha happening with COVID? But anyway, so you're seeing r right here um, an exhibition which is about uh, to, to be mounted and that will be open next week. So if we turn around over here, this is actually the beginning of the archival area, and everything that we have in the archive is um, cataloged in Passport Perfect, and that this will soon be available online as well. Our entire catalog will be available there. Uh, we're still doing the editing of the records and stuff, but here you see stuff which is coming in on a daily basis. It gets cataloged here. Uh, these are all new donations that are c coming in, and so come on and we'll take a look in the archive. So this is what 20, this is what 2,700 or 6 million pages of LGBTQ history looks like. Um, this is all uh, professionally cataloged and arranged here. This section over here, um, these are all serials. Um, and uh, hard copies of these um, are kept here, as you can see. Uh, they're all alphabetically arranged, so you have women's books next to WOMO, next to uh, XYZ. Um, and um, of course, they're very, very heavy. There's a lot of paper and a lot of ink in these shelves. Um, but you know, before we go all the way down here, I just want to show you from a library standpoint and from a gay archive standpoint, I want to show you our rare book collection. So many of the titles that we have, um, of course, every t title that we have is um, out on the publicly facing shelves. But if we have a rare copy of it, um, those are kept in here in uh, the archive uh, simply for archival purposes and also because of the value. So this is where we have signed first editions um, and uh, a lot of other things. So here you see, you see the beginning of the, these are all first editions and signed versions going back to the 19th century. Uh, there are over 900 rare books here. Um, and again, these are all being kept uh, in great c condition. And of course, as I said, all of these titles are out there on the public facing shelves, but these are the ones that are the most valuable and very important for us to keep for archival pur purposes. So those, those go all the way down here. So again, these are the serials. Now, if you go to the website, you will see many of these have been digitized. Um, and under the archive section, you can go to the finding aid. You can find the names of, uh, of these. We're constantly adding to them. Um, and so we would, you'd be able to see if we had a complete run of Daughters of Belitis or The Lavender Letter or Honcho Magazine. Uh, some publications, for example, recently um, uh, eBay stopped selling uh, gay male magazines from the 1970s and 80s. And of course, this is the place where those things can actually be found now because they're important from a research standpoint and from an exhibition standpoint uh, from around the country. So again, just take a little look down one of these aisles here and you can just see um, this one has got uh, some good light in here. So also what I said before um, about how the archive was, was founded. So Mark Silver was involved in um, putting the um, library together, but there was also someone by the name of Joel Starkey who was down here in Florida in Boca. And he started a publication called um, the Southern Gay Liberator. And so it was really just something that he Xeroxed and he cut out little newspaper articles and things that he found. And he wrote to every other gay publication that he could find um, in the United States. And at that time in the early 70s, there weren't that many. And he said to them, look, if I send you my publication, will you send me yours? And there was such a wonderful sense of camaraderie along, uh, between a lot of these gay publishers at the time. So when Joel passed about 20 years ago, all of those holdings actually came to Stonewall. And so it's an, it gives us a great opportunity to be able to have collections of, of serials um, that again, nobody else m might have. So here you're looking at an, a publication from East Lansing, Michigan called Lesbian C Connection. This is going back to 1974. And 
here you see the very first issue, and you see how these publications were simply just mailed out like this. This was a way for people to be able to communicate about what gay life was was like. Um, and again, if it's if it weren't here, you're seeing, you know, mailed to him, Southern Gay Liberator from East Anson. East Lansing, Michigan, you're seeing the communication and the way that a community was built among the people. And again, for researchers, this is invaluable as far as a resource of being able to, uh, being able to see what our history is all about. Now, one of the things, of course, that's interesting to many people is how do we understand about gay culture in the 70s and 80s? And a, and a lot of way of d doing that is looking at the gay publications and particularly the commercial pu publications that were promoting gay businesses at the time. Those were like bars and bathhouses and florists and, and those things. So there would be, there would be those kind of uh, ads and then there would also be personal ads as well. There is a publication here now called Hotspots and um, I was talking to somebody re recently that's here in Fort Lauderdale and they've been in other cities as well too. But you know before people had their phones and they before they had grinder and scruff and those kind of things, if you were going to come to a city you would go to the local newspaper and you would place a personal ad on Thursday afternoon and it would come out on Friday so that if you wanted to meet someone and spend time with, with, with them, you would have an opportunity to do something like that. Of course, that part of the gay publication business has certainly moved away. But I think if we go here, hopefully I've picked a good drawer. By the way, these are all subject matter files. Um, so let me show you this one. So this is something called Clubs, News of Men's Organizations, Clubs Monthly. So um, this one is uh, Biscayne but Boulevard so this one is Florida based and again you're you're taking you're getting an example of how we actually research and understand what gay life is like um, these types of sometimes they're called dismissively called um, bar rags uh, uh, you know we, we just call them serials and publications but these are the ones that I'm talking about that are hugely valuable about being able to find information and presumably accurate information about gay culture at a particular time one of my favorite stories about these publications is uh, a little bit further back there's a publication called this month in Mississippi and in you look at one in 1974 and there would be little news stories as well well as ads in there and the little news stories would just be trying to tell the local gay uh, c community news and things that were h happening and there's a, a story in, in there that's no more no more than a paragraph telling men not to go to this particular park and cruise on Saturday nights because two of them were there and there was a lynching they interrupted a lynching in place this is 1974 the value of this of course is that of course the local c community was warned of the potential danger that that was there, the local gay community. But more importantly, that attempted lynching may never have been recorded anyplace else except for that magazine. And again, that's why these kind of organizations are so, I mean, this is, of course, this is gay history, but this is 20th century American history is what we're looking at. It incorporates all, all of it, and not just in ur urban areas. We're very fortunate that we have a lot of information about things in rural areas as well. Um, I'm going to put club back, and there was one I was thinking, I think it's called cruising, or cruise, C-R. Just to give you another, ex yeah, so this is what I was thinking of. So this is Cruise Magazine. Uh, okay, so this is 92, so it's about 20 years old. So this is D Detroit. And again, it's the same kind of publication. But again, what's interesting is now you look at the back of this one, and now there are 900 numbers being circulated. You go to back to the ones in the 70s, those, the, those aren't being promoted as well. But it's the same thing in which you're seeing businesses listed here. You're seeing bars listed here. Um, you know, uh, theater is being li listed here. It's things that were of interest to the LGBTQ c community at the time. Also, by the way, and speaking of LGBTQ c community, we also have a major trove of publications for the cross-dressing and uh, 
um, tr trans community as well too. We have a big trove of those. So as I said down here, we have all subject matter files and um, uh, they're either subject matter or serials. We have a big textile collection here as well too. And it, what's interesting, somebody was in here the other day and they were saying, you know, the gay community, the LGBTQ community is the only one that can actually tell its history in t-shirts. And it's really true. You know, we've had so much of that uh, in which t-shirts were some way of us to be able to express ourselves, whether it was the March on Washington or human rights or a bar or or fetish or, or anything, sports. I mean, look at them here, television, internet, books, print, Florida, non-Florida. Anita Bryant t-shirts. Um, and so it's really sort of interesting looking at it. Um, down here, let me go to some other early uh, publications. Um, this one is a Florida one. And um, this one is called David. And David, of course, was in Atlanta as well, too. Um, but here you're seeing a publication from nineteen seventy one. So here you're now seeing um, a 1971 Florida publication about gay bars uh, and gay life that is going on. Um, and then, so in this section here, we have a huge Pulp Fiction collection. Um, we have over 2,000 titles of gay and lesbian pulp fiction. We have more serials down here. Um, some of these are quite rare and quite fragile. Um, this is a publication called Gay Life. Um, let me just move this over here. The Midwestern Gay uh, Weekly. And again, these were the kind of things um, that were very important uh, for people to be able to publicize bars and restaurants. And first, a full page ad for a gay bit business here on the back. Um, Chicago based, bit US based. And um, then there's one more box I want to show you. So I'm just going to move a little bit more. In this area with serials, um, I'm sorry, with the, with the area with subject matters, here we have records from many organizations and from political movements. So things in South Florida, such as um, the work that people did to stop Anita Bryant or the Miami-Dade Human Rights Ordinance or the Broward County one. Uh, and then there's lots of different things about gay parenting, gay adoption, gay marriage, all of those t topics um, we have subject matter files on those. And again, to remind everybody to go to stonewall-museum.org under the archive page, and you can find a finding aid. It's about 200 pages long, and you can see all the subject headings that are there. But let me just end with uh, a little file because I like this one so much because it does kind of show how a community archive um, can be developed. And um, this is the Judy Garland box. Of course, many people remember Judy Garland and certainly know of her um, and her impact. But it's the beauty, of course, of, of how community archives get developed. So this box is, is on Judy Garland. And so we start out here with the Judy Garland puzzle, in case somebody has time to, to put that together. And then there is a recent review of the Rene Zellweger film, uh, Judy, which is great. There's some videotapes of TV shows, which are interesting. And then here you see scrapbooks by members of the Judy Garland fan club. And so here, this goes back to 1964 with silver gelatin prints. Uh, that, uh, of her at the time that are kept. Um, and these scrapbooks, they're probably six or seven. Come on over here with the camera. They're probably six or seven of these scrapbooks that are actually kept going back to 1965, 1964, mimeographs of, of these things. Complete discography, um, 
of everything that she did in programs. But then you go through, and here's the program from her memorial service when she passed away in London. And the fact that you can actually say that they sang the Battle Hymn of the Republic at her funeral or her memorial service is sort of an astonishing thing. So in some, I guess, what's interesting about all of these projects about gay history is that there are many the people who are concerned about preserving this stuff, interpreting it, and making it accessible. So if you're in South Florida, uh, please come by. You can see the library. You can see the exhibitions are there. You can certainly go to the website and see what's there and support all the other in-person and online archives that are out there. This is our history. So for those of us in our age group, it's wonderful to actually see this is there. And then if you're younger, it's a wonderful way for you to learn about the history and what really has happened in the last 70 years in the gay movement. So again, I'm Hunter Ohanian, and it's great to be able to spend a little time with you at the Stonewall National Museum and Archives. Thank you. And that concludes another segment of the Gay Archives podcast. You can find more podcasts at gaybarchives.com slash podcast. We also have more information about this podcast and links to the other podcasts we have completed. We hope you enjoy your trip down memory lane.